Hello everyone, and welcome to the 128th episode of Analyzing Evil, featuring Thomas Shelby from Peaky Blinders. One of the most compelling crime dramas ever made, Peaky Blinders offers us a setting this genre rarely explores, and the characters we find within enhance its premise beyond many of its contemporaries. And standing at the center of them all is Thomas Shelby. Ambitious to a fault and ruthlessly efficient, the machinations of Thomas Shelby are far-reaching and consequential. A man who shapes hundreds, if not thousands of lives, with his plots and machinations. Though the Peaky Blinders are inspired by the real-world gang of the same name, their appearance in this show is not a reflection of the actions or structure of that gang, and so we won't be exploring them here. With that in mind, we're going to examine everything we're given about Thomas Shelby in seven sections. Background, relationships, skills and traits, appearance and mannerisms, personality and beliefs, crimes and virtues, and the curse of Thomas Shelby before we examine everything we've learned at the end of this video. Also, I know there's a film coming out next year, and Thomas's story probably isn't finished, but he's so highly requested, I figured I'd cover him now. Perhaps I'll post an update video when that film is released. A side note as well, I wasn't sure if I should refer to him as Thomas or Tommy, so throughout this video, I alternate between the two when I feel it's appropriate, just so you're aware. Now Peaky Blinders is an amazing show, but it is sorely lacking on one front, and that's fishing. Fortunately, our sponsor for this video, Fishing Clash, is here to help. Sporting some of the most realistic graphics you'll find in a video game, Fishing Clash is a great way to relax with some eye-catching scenery while you experience the joy of fishing without having to break the bank or your back. Enjoy locations like the Mediterranean Sea, the Great Barrier Reef, and the Galapagos Islands from the comfort of your own home. And you can even choose to fish from the shore or out at sea to experience all that these waters have to offer. Upgrade your rod and skills to reach even higher levels of fishing mastery, and even experience a competitive environment when you use your upgrades to compete with other players for even more loot in tournaments. Here's some helpful tips for you new players out there. Lures are the most important part of this game, and if you want to start reeling in the big ones, you need to start beating the boss fish in the fisheries. I enjoy winding down with Fishing Clash when I need a break, and you can too by downloading Fishing Clash today by clicking my link down in the description or by scanning the QR code on your screen. When you do, use my gift code, EVIL, and you'll get a $20 value reward completely free, which includes a unique avatar, one mythical lure card, 50 luck power-ups, and 30 weight power-ups to help you catch bigger fish. So have some fun with Fishing Clash today by clicking the link down below and using the code EVIL when you get into the game. Thank you Fishing Clash for sponsoring this video. Now without further ado, let's begin. Thomas was born to Arthur Shelby Sr. and his unnamed mother in Small Heath, Birmingham in the year 1890. Growing up a Romany, Thomas experienced all that his people and culture had to offer. Life amongst the caravans, days spent at their fairs, and a healthy dose of their religious practices and superstitious beliefs. However, as most of you are well aware, the Roma have no set homeland, and just as any person living in a land where another culture is dominant, Thomas was equally influenced by English culture, specifically the culture of the poor working class of Birmingham. So, with a traveler's upbringing and an iron worker's environment, shoeless Thomas Shelby naturally found himself embedded in a world of trouble, one that quickly turned him and his brothers into young hoodlums. Young hoodlums often develop into adolescent hoodlums, and such was likely the case for Thomas, a boy who walked the streets of Smallheath with a razor blade and a screwdriver, a boy who claimed he could cast curses. And for a time, this was his existence. That is, until the Great War started. When World War I broke out in 1914, like many young men, Thomas and his brothers Arthur and John enlisted in the army with stars in their eyes and fire in their heart, hoping to earn glory and fame in the greatest war yet, fighting for the country they loved. However, like many young men, they went and experienced horrors unimaginable in the trenches of France. And when they came back from this dreaded war, there were no more stars and no more fire, as the skies of their warlike ambitions had gone cold and the flames of their passion stamped out by jackboots and mud. After returning from this veritable hell, Tommy and his brothers, empty as they were now, went back to living much the same as they had prior to their departure, with the added benefit of being older bolder, and much more ruthless. And in that capacity, they formed the gang we're all familiar with, the Peaky Blinders. 
This is who Tommy Shelby is at the beginning of this story, and this small amount of background information was monumentally instrumental in forming the man we see in this series. However, his environment and the circumstances of his birth are only a small piece of the puzzle that is Thomas Shelby, and like all of us, it's the people around you who play the largest hand in making you who you are. I've mentioned his parents already, but his relationship with them was less than desirable. I say this about both of them simply because his mother unfortunately committed suicide when he was 19, which is a tragic occurrence for anyone to experience, one that undoubtedly had a negative effect on Tommy in one way or another. However, we have no reason to assume that his relationship to her was unpleasant in any other way, as from what information were given about her, it seems that she was a loving mother. His father, on the other hand, is a different story likely made of that same Romany working-class Birmingham mold. His father appears to have been fairly absent in his children's lives at best, and he would prove to be completely absent following the death of his wife, as he was unable to handle the burden of raising five children alone, and thus abandoned his family. Now I'm sure a criminal father also had quite the negative effect on Thomas, namely in normalizing criminal behavior. However, it stands to reason that Arthur Sr. served as a source of hatred and abandonment, as the only member of the Shelby family who would dare speak to him following his departure was his namesake, Arthur Jr. And aside from supposedly using his gin recipe when making his own, Thomas is never seen interacting with his father. However, with the loss of his parents, Tommy gained two valuable surrogates, Polly Gray and Charlie Strong, his father's brother and his mother's admirer. Charlie provided the children of Mrs. Shelby with all the protection and love that he'd wished to give to her, and for the remainder of his life, Uncle Charlie served as one of Thomas's closest confidants. Polly, however, played an altogether more important role, that of mother, partner, and guiding light in the dark world of the Shelbys. If it weren't for the mostly constant support of Polly, whose intelligence is only surpassed by Thomas's within the family, he would have likely been dead a long time ago. But because of her, he succeeds, and she played a great part in molding him into the success that he is, and much of who Thomas is can be seen within Polly. On almost the same level regarding influence as Polly is Ada, who we could consider to be the Birmingham woman who shaped Tommy, just as Polly is the Romany woman, accomplishing much the same. And along with Polly, Ada has constantly served as someone Thomas can rely on and draw valuable advice and direction from throughout this series. Perhaps equally as important to his success were his brothers John and Arthur. Much like Thomas, Polly, and Ada, the brothers haven't always seen eye to eye, but when it came down to supporting their brother, they did so nearly without question, and with the help of loyal family assets in his pocket, Tommy reached heights he couldn't have otherwise. Of course, there were other gangster compatriots who ran with the Shelby brothers that influenced Thomas as well, but valuable instruments like family business associates are much more influential. The last person who directly influenced the making of Thomas Shelby is Greta Gerasi, the woman that he was dating prior to his enlistment in the war. As told by Jesse Eden, Thomas had been deeply in love with this woman, and unfortunately, after his return from the war, she had come down with consumption, which is an old-fashioned way to refer to tuberculosis. Thomas reportedly stayed by her bedside day in and day out, comforting her and doting upon her until her very last breath a heartwarming and breaking show of his devotion and love. This would be Thomas's first experience with losing a lover, and along with his experiences during the war, which we'll touch on a little later, this would be a recurring theme in his life. And during the following years, he would attempt to rekindle that lost love, and each time, in one way or another, that love was denied to him, in an often tragic way, and recapturing a lost love that he felt before he was broken in the war, a love that is doomed to continually shatter, as that first love had, marks Thomas as an often criminally lonely man, perhaps not physically, but certainly mentally and emotionally. Now the circumstances of his birth and his influences greatly shaped his talents and skills, which are many. Thomas is first and foremost a man of likely genius-level intellect, and it's this intelligence and the skills that it gives him that allows him to succeed in impossible endeavors that others in the Shelby family could only dream of achieving. Through Thomas, the Shelby family rise from a backstreet razor gang living on a barge in a canal, to owners of horse tracks, to the heads of their very own company, one that eventually owns virtually all of Birmingham and has extensive dealings in international business. In this capacity, we see Thomas evolving from small-time gangster to big-time gangster to CEO and finally to politician. And he does so because he has a mind well-suited for strategy and planning. A consistent theme in this series is Tommy's ever-evolving and complex plans. 
And though hearing the words, Tommy has a plan, is something that many members of his family come to dread, as the series progresses, it's these plans that more often than not provide the best solution to any problem they might be facing. And whether it be Billy Kimber, Inspector Campbell, the Russians, the Changretas, the Billy Boys, or Oswald Mosley, Tommy typically manages to get ahead of any situation he's in, though that isn't always the case, as we'll explore a little later on. Now any good plan, and any good strategy for that plan, isn't complete without tactics, and Tommy certainly has no shortage of those. Chief among his skills as a tactician has to be his deductive reasoning, and his keen awareness that information is the greatest asset to have when trying to accomplish anything. Tommy shows numerous times throughout this series that he's not just capable of planning out his own actions, but accurately predicting the plans of others, and he does so by thoroughly examining his environment, the people in it, and by maintaining a vast network of spies and informants. We're never introduced to just exactly how Tommy acquires the most intimate details of his enemies, but it stands to reason that through his contacts in the Romani community and his employment of many street-level criminals, Tommy is able to plant unsuspecting spies in any place he pleases and order his more unsavory skilled employees to steal information for him when necessary. This allows Tommy to know more about his enemies than those closest to them might, and that's why though we frequently find Tommy at the cusp of being caught with his pants down, when we do, it turns out that he's wearing a second pair, and he's already cut the belt of his enemies when they weren't watching his every move. And that's what Tommy does. He watches your every move, every mannerism, every relationship, every quirk, and kink, and hobby, and weakness are all divined by Thomas Shelby, and his expertise in this area is what allows him to be a master in the one skill he has that underpins all that he does, manipulation. From situations to people, Tommy is ever the manipulator, subtly moving events in the direction he would like them to go, and as Ada remarks at one point in the series, whenever Tommy asks someone to do something for him, the answer to whether or not they will is almost always yes. Whether it be the highly volatile Alfie Solomons, or his closest allies like his brother Arthur, it's likely that whenever you see Tommy asking someone to do something, they do it. And they do so because he is a master of conversation and desire. His words enticing people with the grandeur of his suggestions as he gives them exactly what they want, while serving himself in the same breath. Another trait of his that helps him in these endeavors is his pragmatism. As Tommy, though he can be emotional and vindictive, very much so in fact, is more often than not aligned with the best possible solution that will further his interests, no matter how it might make him feel. And whereas people like Arthur or Polly will often react to any given scenario with emotions first, Tommy nearly always uses his head first. Because of this, Tommy will use nearly anyone for his own gain, whether that be organizations that he's pledged to join, that he's informing on, or the police, or even rival gangsters. Tommy will do what he has to do to gain an advantage in his world without regard to any set principles or values beyond his own ambition. Outside of his head though, Tommy has quite a few other useful skills. Physically, he's quite strong and agile, and his skills in physical combat are put to the test quite a few times throughout this story, and Tommy typically comes out on top when that time does come. He's also an expert with firearms, which can be owed to his time spent in the Great War, where he was a member of the Small Heath Rifles. He seems to have decent knowledge of horse care, and he's also skilled on a technical and practical level, being able to manufacture and plant bombs just as well as he can dig a mile-long tunnel. Yes, Thomas Shelby is an incredibly able man with a storied history, and those translate well into how he looks and acts. Thomas is nearly always dressed in a suit, and as the show progresses, these suits only get more and more luxurious. He's often seen sporting the flat cap that serves as his organization's namesake, and his hair is always well trimmed, and his face clean shaven. His high cheekbones, brilliant blue eyes, strong chin, and generally handsome features give him a magnetism that draws in men and women alike with his features alone. Much of the draw for men is the challenge that his stern demeanor provides, as Tommy mostly presents himself as stoic and calm, and when an enemy is facing his stoniness, these aspects of Thomas appear haughty and arrogant. His movements aren't stiff, but he's not flowy by any means. And when he does make movements, they're deliberate and measured. And perhaps the best words to describe the image that Thomas Shelby projects are statuesque and grand. Overall, gentle and loving would not be good ways to describe Thomas Shelby, but gruff and dour. However, by all accounts, it wasn't always this way, and the image that he projects, that's crafted from his serious personality, was by all accounts, not always so serious. 
Prior to World War I, many characters have noted that Tommy was a much happier, much more alive person. He laughed and smiled a lot, he played and cajoled, and he expressed the love and care that he feels for his family, openly and warmly. Tommy was reportedly even an idealist, as he was a young member of the recently formed Communist Party, a man who wanted the world of strife and misery that he inhabited, and the people within it, to be lifted up and saved from their soul-crushing existence. All that changed during the Great War, though, and the man that Thomas Shelby was prior to his deployment all but died in the trenches of France. Like many, if not all young men who were sent to the trenches, Tommy developed a case of post-traumatic stress disorder, and a rather severe one at that. Days on end spent tunneling underground in the muck and the mud, sleeping in these hovels for no more than a few hours at a time, living an existence constantly soaked to the bone and filthy with blood and dirt as your friends, family, and comrades were torn to pieces right beside you, gave Thomas Shelby the gift of horrid flashbacks and sleepless nights. Nightmares that could only be quelled by a constant occupation of his mind or through the use of substances like opium and alcohol. There's more than just his experiences during the war that exacerbate his condition, though, and the many tragedies that he suffers throughout this series only serve to send Thomas deeper down the rabbit hole of despair and misery. However, these tragedies rarely bring out much emotion from Tommy. When Grace is killed, he's incredibly distraught and heartbroken, and perhaps his feelings for Grace were the last vestige of hope that this dead man walking had, and once it was shattered, most other tragedies were met with a lack of emotion rather than an outpouring of it the exceptions being the death of Polly, his other half spiritually, and the turmoil he experienced during his daughter's sickness. Because of these experiences, Tommy is very much the melancholic stoic that he appears to be on the inside. He's a bit more open and friendly during the first season of the show, but as time progresses and more and more tragedy is laid at his feet, Tommy becomes nearly emotionless, and the only constant throughout the entire show is his unending ambition. Sure, we see Tommy pursuing multiple women, both bought and romantically, and he drinks, smokes, and gambles like any gangster of his station might at various points in this series. But everything that Tommy is and does is always subsumed by his ambition. Though he is quite forgiving when it comes to his family, and even with certain enemies, as we see him caring for the well-being of his immediate family and loved ones, like Arthur, who he constantly tries to help through all the hardship that he experiences, and like Danny Wisbang, his compatriot whose death he fakes in order to save him from vengeance at the hands of some Italian men who he wronged. But he's also equally unforgiving, brutal, and ruthless, and he even states that he's willing to kill children at varying points in this series, like when he threatens to kill Irene O'Donnell and her son in season two. And though it was a difficult decision, the brutality of his character can be seen when he attempts to torture Mr. Jangretta for causing the accidental death of his wife. Suffice to say, Tommy Shelby is simultaneously a man you can depend on and one you can't cross and expect to come out the other side intact. That isn't to say that he isn't without his virtues though, as while the majority of what he does is done for himself, it is also done for his family, and Thomas cares deeply about them, even if he does a poor job of showing it a lot of the time. And his desire to make a better life for not just himself, but the people he loves, is an admirable quality to have. His strong sense of family values can be directly tied to his upbringing, and along with those values, he was instilled an in ardent belief in the supernatural. Thomas and his flock, aside from Arthur after his marriage, don't necessarily show themselves to be religious people, and Tommy even claims that he has no religion. However, they are all incredibly superstitious, and it's his mindfulness of superstition that serves as the sole source of irrationality in Tommy's life. Shooting an otherwise healthy horse in the head because of a curse, ridding himself of a sapphire because of a curse, and blaming the death of his wife and the illness of his daughter on that very same curse, all caused Tommy to act in ways that he otherwise wouldn't if he did not hold these beliefs, much to the detriment of himself and those around him. Other than these beliefs though, what Tommy believes the most is in his own capabilities and the limitless possibilities that he could achieve when his power is taken in the proper direction, and it's the desire for power, prosperity, and peace that ultimately drive all that Thomas Shelby does, to make a world where his family is secure and happy, and the images of death and destruction that haunt him are quieted. Blunt, brutally honest, and willful, Thomas Shelby is the perfect vessel for all that his family is capable of, and though much of who he is projects strength and conviction, it's these traits that give him the capability to cause massive amounts of harm to nearly all who surround him, and the crimes of Thomas Shelby, both personal and illicit, are many. 
and the list of crimes that can be attributed directly to Tommy or his influence is staggering to say the least. Illicit gambling, bootlegging, smuggling, drug trafficking, extortion, contract killings, and perhaps even prostitution are all things that Tommy or his organization have been involved in at one point or another. It's through Thomas that men are ordered to be killed on behalf of the Peaky Blinders, and even the murders that happen without his direct blessing are only allowed to occur because he provides safety and security for the people doing the killing. With that in mind, it's perfectly reasonable to assume that hundreds of people have lost their lives due to the direct or indirect influence of Thomas Shelby, and thousands more have lost their livelihoods or loved ones. Now, many of the people who die as a result of the Peaky Blinders activities are criminals themselves or their members of organizations involved in criminal activities. And so the majority of the deaths that occur on his watch are, while not excusable, more forgivable because they fall under the category of crimes committed against people who are playing the criminal game. So to condemn him for those crimes specifically would be an error considering who he's committing them against. Now there are some notable exceptions of course, and those can be found in both the crimes he orders and in the ones he commits himself. Of the murders he commits personally, there are a few that fall under the more forgivable umbrella, those being the murder of Malachi Byrne, the IRA member that he brutally beat to death in the Garrison pub, Billy Kimber, Field Marshal Henry Russell, several of Luca Changretta's men, Mickey, and Michael Gray. However, there are four people who seem to have been less than deserving of death by Tommy's hands, the first being Eamon Duggan. Tommy killed Eamon on the orders of Irene McDonnell and the IRA, and though it's likely that he betrayed them in some respect, we have no idea what Eamon's crimes actually were, and so it's difficult to decide whether or not his murder can be excused as being committed against a criminal or someone who's done horrid things. There are three others that we can claim are innocent, however. Evadne Barwell and the two men at her camp who Tommy murders with a machine gun. Tommy murders them in retaliation for laying a curse upon his daughter, the same curse that supposedly affected Evadne's daughter when she died of tuberculosis at age seven. Now this show is rife with superstition and mysticism, which blurs the line between fiction and fact. But if we're going to assume that the sapphire Evadne came into possession of was nothing more than a sapphire, just as Grace said when she visited Tommy during one of his hallucinations, then murdering her for laying a curse that would have been as equally ineffective on Ruby was nothing more than rage-filled, cold-blooded murder committed against a woman who only had supernatural malicious intent but who was otherwise innocent. And out of everything that Tommy has done or has ordered to be done, this was a shocking act that colored him as more than a criminal mastermind waging war against criminals. Though this is the most horrific thing that Tommy has done personally, by far his greatest crime is enabling others to commit crimes. People like Arthur would not be able to murder a boy in a boxing match and get away with it if he weren't protected by his brother. Members of the Peaky Blinders wouldn't be able to bomb a bar because someone was racist towards one of their members and caused a fight. Parents wouldn't have to worry about their children becoming the victims of collateral damage during one of the many shootouts that occur throughout this story. We could spend all day making a list like this, but that's the problem with criminal activity that's committed on such a massive scale. So many lives are negatively affected for hundreds of different reasons, and the blame can only be placed on the men and women committing the crimes and the men and women who enable them to commit these crimes. It's not all misery and horror though, and there are many good things to be said about Thomas Shelby. I've already discussed how deeply he cares for those around him, and the lengths he would go to to ensure their security, happiness, and prosperity is admirable. But as time goes on, and Tommy becomes disillusioned with his place in the world, he actually makes strides to make the world a better place for more people than just his immediate family or associates. After Tommy is elected to parliament, he uses this position, much as he uses any other position he's been in, to advance his own interests. But we do see him establishing charitable organizations for orphans, and he even goes so far as to threaten a nun who caused a young girl to hang herself due to the punishment she received from her. However, once he comes into contact with Oswald Mosley, he begins to desire to make a greater impact on the world outside of creating wealth for himself. And rather than being a man who's comfortable sowing evil for his own sake, he wants to become one that stamps it out for the sake of others. In this capacity, Tommy endeavors to undermine Mosley and his burgeoning fascist party as best he can, and while his success in this department isn't too great, it speaks volumes about how his character has developed over the years, as he is now actively sacrificing the well-being of himself as well as those around him for the greater good. 
something he does to an even greater extent when he vows to demolish his home and build affordable housing there and elsewhere in Birmingham, a far cry from the self-serving ambition that had been a staple for most of his actions after the Great War. But no matter where his actions fall on the scale of morality, all that Thomas Shelby does has to contend with something that hangs over him like a noose, the curse of Thomas Shelby. As I said earlier, this series blurs the lines between fantasy and fiction when it comes to the superstitious, as many of the curses and rituals of Thomas and his people end up being proved in one way or another. While this is true, these curses serve as a vehicle, one that expertly delivers a lesson that you can find throughout many stories involving criminals, that lesson being, your actions have consequences. All the misery and woe that seems to follow the Shelby family like a shadow could be blamed on curses, and if that's what you believe, that's perfectly fine. But when you look at all that befalls them, you can trace the threads that lead to their various tragedies right back to the source, their own actions. Grace would not have been murdered had the Shelby family not insulted and tried to overtake the Changretas. John wouldn't have been murdered for the same reason. Michael wouldn't have needed to be killed had he not been brought into the world of the Shelby family. Even when Tommy is trying to do good things, bad things happen, like when Charlie Younger dies in a car bombing because Thomas involved him in his play against Mosley, or when Polly, Abarama, and Barney perish for the same reason. To be fair, the tragic things that happen to those around Tommy as a result of his good intentions can be chalked up to the influence of the powers that be, but regardless, people still perish as a result of Tommy's actions. So with this in mind, we can infer that the curse of Thomas Shelby is indeed his inability to understand the limits of his ambition, and it's his and his family's hubris, greed, and lust for power that serves as the sole source of all the misery that befalls them. It's the source of their success as well, but is success worth the untimely death of your loved ones? I'd argue no. I wouldn't sacrifice my wife or my brother for the sake of power and money. But for Thomas, these are just facts of life, and his ambition and refusal to change his ways throughout the course of this story is what ends up being the undoing of many who surround him. Who knows what the future holds for Thomas and his clan, but with all that we've discussed regarding Tommy now, we must ask ourselves, who was Thomas Shelby? Born into a traveler's culture and raised in the poverty-stricken streets of working-class Birmingham, Thomas became what many around him became during this time period, a criminal. From a young age, he made his mark as a thief, but also as a kind and caring man who would do anything for those around him. After being broken in the Great War, Thomas would return to Birmingham to do just that, but now with his soul taken from him, Tommy set about ruthlessly advancing his family's position by whatever means necessary. As up-and-coming Lord of Birmingham, he sowed death and misery on a massive scale, enriching himself and those around him at the expense of many others. It wasn't just his enemies who suffered, though, it was his family, and more so, Thomas himself, driving himself down a path of despair that only amplified what he'd already experienced. Part of why Tommy worked so hard to become who he was was to stop the voices, to make sense of the world, to eliminate the madness of his existence as a wraith. And in this effort, Thomas Shelby pushed forward and enmeshed himself in darkness, the horror of his actions reflecting back upon him and his loved ones. At the pinnacle of his power, Tommy became paranoid and vindictive, assuming that all his family wanted him for was for the money that he brought them, but all the negativity that came with his position was as manufactured as his hallucinations. And had he taken the time to live more, to love more, and to cherish what he had, rather than ignore it in favor of ambition, Tommy Shelby might have been a much happier man. But he couldn't do that. He couldn't stop marching forward, trying to reach an end that never came. And while he may have found peace at the end of this series, it remains to be seen whether or not Thomas Shelby can truly turn a new leaf, whether all the lives lost, all the strife that he caused, are just a distant memory, or if Thomas Shelby is doomed to continue living in a world of evil that he created. Thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Analyzing Evil, and I hope you've enjoyed. What are your thoughts on Thomas Shelby? Did I miss anything? Let me know down below, or leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured while you're at it. If you like this video, hit that thumbs up button, and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. A big thank you to all of my subscribers, to my patrons, and to anyone who's decided to honor me with a super thank, and a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now. Join the channel's Discord server and Reddit and follow me on the social media platforms listed below to keep up with the channel.
As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.